Before we begin, um, I know that um, we still have COVID in our community. We have some people with masks on. We can open the door if people would like some fresh air in the room. Yeah? Okay, so we'll open the door and then if it gets too cold, then please feel free to, to let people know and we can close the window again, the door again. And, and there's no doubt that, you know, we were planning to hold this event in August. It's now November and here we are three years in and, um, you know, we, our events, as with all events in the creative sector at the moment, are still being impacted. So I'd just really like to thank you for being here today. And our focus is very much on quality bespoke events. I think um, the larger events of days gone by are, are very hard in, in the creative sector at the moment. So thank you everyone for being here and um, supporting our local word showcase. The local word this year is the reincarnated version of the National Non-Fiction Word, word Festival that we were very proud to run from 2013 until 2020 when the event was run totally online. Um, unlike Word for Word, this event is really includes fiction and both non-fiction topics and books. And we did open it exclusively to local authors, writers and creatives living within the G21, our five member local council area. And this has been created to support and foster our growing local talent of aspiring, emerging and established writers in our region, of which we are very blessed to have many and of which many have also relocated during the last two or three years to our region. And so, we see it as a, a prime role of ours to be supporting our creatives, new and emerging. There are five writers' workshops. There were five writers' workshops held yesterday at libraries across our region, including Colac, Queenscliff, Bannockburn, and one online. And today we also have some workshops being held in Torquay and Warm Ponds. So in total, we were running 11 events featuring 23 local author, authors and creatives. Uh, we have had a couple of cancellations due to illness. Today there'll be almost a full program of panel discussions and author talks. And of course, this evening we'll be coming together at Kikiri Niche, which is our ground floor. Did I pronounce that correctly? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it means gathering place. We talk together to celebrate the extraordinary wealth of literary and creative talent found in our region, and there are still some tickets available if you are interested in coming along. But this would all not be possible without the generosity and support of our partners and sponsors, and our principal partners today are Deakin University and the City of Greater Geelong through its Creative Communities Grant Program. Both organisations have generously supported the Word for Word Festival, um, and since it began nine years ago, and very kindly agreed to switch their contribution from 2021 to the event today. So thank you for being here. Thanks also to Writers Victoria, Belinda, Borrow Box Audio, Dumbo Feather Magazine, and South Geelong Farmers Market have kindly supported our individual local word workshops and sessions. Finally, thank you and let the show begin. I'd like to introduce today's panel chair, local author Sue Lawson. Sue writes books for children and young adults. Her books have won the Australian Family Therapist Award for Children's Literature and been shortlisted for the Prime Minister's Literary Awards and the Children's Book Council of Australia Book of the Year Awards. Sue collaborates with Bunwarong Elder, um, Auntie Faye Muir, oh no, Pay my respects, thank you for being here today, who is also a panellist today. Their books include acclaimed picture books, Respect and Family, the first two books in the Magabala Books Our Play series, and Ngana Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Words and Phrases. Sue's latest and 31st book, You Matter, a collaboration with Geelong author and healer Sue Hindle, came out earlier this year. So, please join me in welcoming Sue. Thank, Thank you, you, Vanessa. 
Hello, everybody, and welcome. First of all, Karina, thank you so much. I, I'm very lucky that I travel a lot and get to witness some beautiful and be part of some beautiful welcome to countries, but no one measures up to Karina's, I can tell you. They're, they are just beautiful, so thank you. Now, we're going to also be joined by Auntie Edie, but I will just give you a bit of an introduction before I bring Edie on the screen. So, our panel is nothing about us without us and it's a slogan that communicates the idea that no policy should be decided by anybody without the full involvement and direct participation of the body that that policy is being decided about and today we use that statement as a springboard for our discussion about how first nations people and culture are represented in publishing and how that's been done in the past as well so today we are so lucky to have three powerhouses, two that still live in Geelong, one of them defected. After, <laughs> after five years, she's gone back to the sunshine. So I'll introduce Edie first. Auntie Edie Wright, or Auntie Edith Wright, if you prefer. Hi, Edie. Edie has left us and gone back to Western Australia. But while she was here in Geelong, she has achieved some amazing things, particularly in education and with our schools, with raps that she's been doing. Edie's a Bardi, a Bardi elder from the Dampier Peninsula north of Broome in Western Australia. She's had incredible experience in education across the two sectors and continues to be involved in research in that area and really passionate about First Nations students <coughs> and their, I guess, the opportunities that they're given. Um, she's also an author. Full Circle is her first biography. I'm sure she's got more to come published by Fremantle Arts Press in 2001. And her latest book, which I've got there, I won't juggle everything and get it up and show you, is Charlie Swim. So, Auntie Edie, thank you for joining us from Western Australia. She was supposed to be here with us today, but she took off before the event, didn't you, Edie? <laughs> <laughs> I just took the opportunity quick while the borders were open to sneak <laughs> back home. But I've left... Um, I've left four grandchildren and a beautiful, uh, two sons and a daughter-in-law still over there. So uh, we haven't totally defected. But, yeah, so uh, no, thank you for those beautiful words, Sue. And more importantly, Karina, thank you for that heartfelt um, welcome to country. In the Kimberley, we have a word called Liam, and it's, it's about how you are feeling in your heart and, and how you're moved by your emotions. And... You know, Karina, your welcome to country has put my Leanne in, in a beautiful place um, this morning, so thank you. And great to see my old mates there, um, <laughs> Sue and Faye too. Not so much the old, if you don't mind. Thanks very much, Edie. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm, I'm not sorry. sure if I actually said too that Edie is also on, um, is a director of Mugabala Books, so she's also kind of our boss, so it would be nice to her. <laughs> <laughs> I'll also introduce Karina, because Karina you'll have seen around, but she is an incredible woman, another powerhouse. She's a Wadawurrung woman and she lives and works on Wadawurrung country here in Geelong. Or, Jil no, you do it for Jilang. me. Geelang, thank you. I'm shocking at pronunciation. Auntie Edie and um, Karina are kinder to me. This one, not so much. You'll see the eye roll and she will go, <laughs> no, nah, that's not how you say it, but that's Okay. Um, Karina is Manager and culture of Cultural Education for the Wadawurrung Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation and they're a registered Aboriginal party, which is the RAP that I mentioned earlier, uh, under the Aboriginal Heritage Act 2006. The corporation actively seeks to protect and concern, conserve Wadawurrung living cultural uh, heritage, including planning and design initiatives. As well as that, she is one of the busiest women outside of these two that I've ever met. She is constantly sharing culture, sharing knowledge, advising. She's just all over the place. So we're so lucky to have her sitting here for a certain amount of time. She does have to fly off at 11.30 and I, I was now. not surprised. I don't, I don't <laughs> Oh, you now. don't now? No. Oh, good. No, she's here, so we're lucky. It got, it's been delayed. <laughs> oh, good. I mean, no, not good, but we're glad you're here for the full thing. And finally, my friend, my other friend, Artie Faye Muir, who we met in a cafe, oh gosh, I don't know how many, seven years ago now? I think it's And with, within <laughs> 30 seconds? That's, that was it, and we've been working together since that time, and it's the joy and privilege of my writing life to work with Auntie Faye. 
Andy Fay is a senior, senior Bunnelbrong. Is that all right? Yeah. And Wamba Wamba Elder. <laughs> this is all Fay's work. Anything I get right is Fay's work. She's a community leader. She's a Koori Court Elder. Um, she's an educator. She's a former nurse. She's a language specialist. She's a pre prison educator and visitor. Uh, she's also on, and she never mentions this, but she is also on the Victorian Honour Roll of Women and the Victorian Aboriginal Honour Roll. She's a very quiet achiever. We've written, I think, about nine books together, but four are out, <coughs> the three picture books that Vanessa mentioned, plus Nunga, which I can get to easily, which is a collection of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander phrases that we wrote to put in classrooms, to put in families. So, you know when you go, what is country? Or what is an aunt or what is an elder? It's all in here. And our theory with that is that our young people, if they understand it, they're gonna make the changes that we haven't been able to. So please welcome these three fabulous powerhouses and how lucky are we to have them here. Now, my first question, and I'm going to do it to Edie first because she's in the sun in Western Australia and we're in the rain, so she deserves to be caught off notice. What does the expression, Auntie Edie, not about us without us, what does that mean to you? Uh, it, it's about the involvement, the consultation, the empowering... Um, working with First Nations people at all levels on all subjects, be it involvement in the arts, be it involvement in, in education, be it involvement in health, um, be it involvement in social policy. It's the involvement and the consultation at all levels. And it's about working with us and it's about doing things with us, not doing things to us. So it's that genuine consultation of deep listening with First Nations people about what they see as important and co of cultural value to them. Karina, do you want to add anything to that? Um, Aunt pretty much nailed everything there <laughs> quite beautifully. Uh, so for me, Wuring Wuring, which is Wuring is ear, Wuring Wuring is the name of our elder, and it's so it's deep listening. So you must always deep listen to your elders to learn so the knowledge can be passed on. Language is more than just one word, it, it, it tells a bigger story, and that's an example of just learning one word and how a story comes about of that. As a Wadarung woman on Wadarung country, um, following on from what Auntie Edie said, it's important to understand intellectual property. Like language belongs to Wadarung people. So if language is going to be used, you need to book a consultation, you need to have the authority to be able to use that. Um, it's also um, a respectful thing to do as well. So not without us, just like Aunty Edie said, you know, it's with us, it's in collaboration with us, engage with us, but don't do it without us. Um, often we've got to go and fix things up quite a lot and often you'll be doing the right thing but the more you can know that, you know, consult first, reach out um, and do those things first so we can collaborate together and it can be right and we don't have to um, redo it. Annie Faye, did you want to add anything to that? <clears throat> I think the most important um, aspect is working with us, not a working sort of on, in silos. You can't say, tell us, this is what you're going to do. You work with us and ask us, not tell us what to do. It's asking and working alongside us is really important to get that, um, get the outcome that we want, not what you want. That's really important for all of us. This is a question that we could spend 50 hours with you guys answering, but I'm going yes. to ask it anyway. Yes. What, can you think of examples of where people have acted without you and just gone, this is what we're going to do, that'll fix everything that you'd like to point out, just to get the idea of the mess that it makes when people don't work with you? 
anyone jump in there. I have one that's come to me straight away. I have many. We come across mm -hmm. that probably every day, um, that kind of example. But one was um, the government sector and they had put out a media release to name a new school um, and that new school was being named after a Wadarong ancestor with no consultation oh. and the media release had gone out. Then um, when we brought that to their attention that it's disrespectful, so if, if you're going to use a name as someone who's passed, um, in, in our culture you normally would not mention their, their name. Um, so there's, you know, those cultural protocols that take place. So we went through that process. But because they had put so much work into it, they really just trying to persuade us to, you know, just do it. And we, we really had to stand our ground. But, um, yeah, that's just one example. There is many examples. And have you got one that particularly gets you? <laughs> I just mean to ask for one. I know there's I, lots. <laughs> I, I, um, it's... Education, as you know, is very dear to my heart and that always brings to mind where schools are, <clears throat> are given funding and they're told how to spend it. So all, straight away you have the parameters of um, we know what's best for you, therefore we'll, we'll set the parameters. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the funding is only short term three years. So by the time perhaps you've got a program running, they cut the funding. But it's it's this whole concept of we know what's best for you sort of thing rather than genuinely consulting. And often you're told you have to spend this funding yesterday. So, you know, and, and that's why we haven't closed the gap in education is mm. because of this concept of telling us what they think is right for um, First Nations students and families and schools in Australia. Mm. Faye? Um, one of the things that comes to mind for me is um, the education department. Mm. They um, told the kindergartens to um, include First Nations languages in their, in their kinders, no consultation whatsoever with our um, traditional owners and not even finding out if there were language workers to come in and um, do this with the children. So that was one of the things that I really put my foot down and said, you can't do that just because they had so many kinders that were wanting to uh, use First Nations language in their kinder but they hadn't consulted us at all. So that was one of the, um, one of the real bugbears of trying to get through to the um, Department of Education. And just, Annie Faye, on that of languages, um, you have often told me that, you know, there's so many areas reclaiming their language that yes. they're not in that position, are they? Yeah. I'll let no. you say that better than I would. That's right. Because our languages have been a sleeping language for so many years, because our elders weren't allowed to speak their language, they had to speak English, and it was the policy of the day. Um, our people nowadays are reawakening those languages, and they want to um, teach their own families um, their own language first before they take it out into the wider community. And I think that's only only fair to to do it that way. And, you know, government departments are still saying, oh, can we have a word for such and such? <laughs> and it's really, you know, how many times do we have to hit them over the head and say, now, just listen, we're still learning to speak our language as well because, you know, our languages weren't written down by us. So we've had to look through all the, um, all the different resources that uh, other people have collected our languages and look at how that spelling has come about. So we've, we've got to do a lot of background work yeah. and we can't just, you know, give them a word that they want. And, of course, some of our languages don't have the words that they want anyway, so that we've got to make up those language words for them. 
Someone might have told me that they were asked for a word that it had to be easy pr to pronounce. Exactly. That's why I giggled. I won't say who told me that story. <laughs> and also, you know, I come across somebody said, well, why isn't there just one language? <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, you haven't been listening what I, to what I've been saying. Are you familiar with how many languages there are in Victoria? Is anyone not? Would you like to share that one, Anifa? How many there are in Victoria? There's 44 different languages in Victoria. And Australia-wide? There's over 260, but then there's also dialects. Oh. So there's over 600 yeah. languages. Mm. So, you know, give us a word quick and make sure we can pronounce it. Yeah. And on that point, and Auntie Fail, I hope, and Edie and Corinna will back me up on this, where we're so lucky in Geelong is that Corinna and the Wadawurrung people are so generous in letting us use names for libraries, for all sorts of places. Don't be afraid to say them. You will butcher them. <laughs> That's OK. You've got to try, don't you, Faye? You do have to try. <laughs> That's for sure. And, you know, if you... Um, I, when I send a, a word out to somebody, I also send a little... Um, a, a little, um, how to Dragon. pronounce it? Yep. Yeah, pronunciation. Yep. As well on the on the phone, so that they can hear me saying the word, so that they don't butcher it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But don't be. It's better that you try. I think. Of if, course. As a non um, First Nation person, I think our role is to be respectful and try and be prepared. Get uncomfortable with getting it wrong because we're going to get it wrong. I get it wrong every day. And just think, you know, our elders had to speak English. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk stories. Um, Corinna, as a child, how, what sort of stories were there for you to actually see yourself? Because we talk a lot about children. It's important to see yourself in a story. Yeah, so um, in my era of being a young girl, um, I really struggled. Well, well, back when I was a young girl, it was a secret. It was a secret. It was what my, my father had been through, my nan had been through, and it was a secret that I kept. Um, but it was also how I was trying to find my identity because everything at my age, every book which we had the comments said, but, um, Annie Edie or someone had said when we'd had a yarn earlier, was about the, um, you know, all the books showed bums and spears. And they were all, you know, very dark coloured skin. So you're only referred to, which is an absolutely horrible word to use, but I will say it if you were a full-blooded Aboriginal person. So if you weren't, that perception was you weren't. So it was really hard. And as a, as a young girl, I can sit here now quite proud and be proud of who I am. But as little people, you can't. You don't have that strength as a young person. And it was so challenged back in that era. And it was a really, really difficult time. So there was nowhere that represented who I was as, you know, as a First Nations young girl and it was really really challenging and even on tv and things like that it only showed aboriginal people no clothes on no shoes on living out the bush or walking out the bush so it was really hard as a little person trying to connect with that today what we find with our little people is they have the flag that they physically can connect with um, having grandchildren myself um, they can say that they're Wadawurrung girls but um, I couldn't proudly say that. But we see it when we're in the kindergartens that the kids will say, that's my flag, that's my dad's flag, that's my grandmother's flag. And they have that to connect with. But it's really challenging. But I'll also acknowledge that the generations before me was much more challenging. But it was a very challenging space. It's why I do what I do today. So we can create those culturally safe pathways and recognition. So our young people aren't hiding behind their hooded jumpers. Mm -hmm. they, they know who they are and where they belong and that is really important for our spirit, strength and resilience of our young people because our two worlds, there isn't one path. We always have to walk two separated paths from when you leave your home and you go to school. What you do in your home culturally and when you walk out that door, you, you're walking a different path and they, they just don't join together and it's really challenging. Much better today, but for quite a few generations, um, many challenges we have all faced. 
Mm. Edie, what about for you being in Western Australia and growing up on Bardi Country? You grew up in Bardi Country, didn't you? I think I've got that right. But growing up in um, Western Australia... I was, <clears throat> I was still connected with my Bardi culture in an underworld way, if you want to put it. Um, I'm a product of assimilation. I know that sounds harsh, but we, my grandmother especially, who I spent quite a bit of time on a, um, a place called um, the Reserve in, in, in Derby, but I, I managed to hear her language. I managed to see her speaking it. I'm, I managed to, um, to learn about our kinship structure and meet extended family, but we did it in a discreet way. And um, I, I guess I was lucky, but I was never allowed to celebrate it. So in many ways, my grandmother kind of kept that ticking over, but it was only within the reserve situation. Once we moved out of the reserve back into um, a, um, a state housing, we, we had to speak English and we had to, and there was certainly no, no stories. Um, there was storytelling when I was with my grandmother, so I, I was quite, quite fortunate like that. And now for your grandchildren, I mean, I've seen one of your beautiful boys front and centre after a welcome being involved in the, smoke, in the, in the um, smoking. So for them it's a lot different, isn't it? Oh, it's so hopeful now. It is so hopeful with the, um, with, um, the amount of literature coming out now, written by First Nations authors, illustrators and creators. Um, the the the, stu um, the dancing, the arts, everything you name it, they can now uh, see themselves. They can see their their culture valued. They can see themselves being recognised. Um, so yeah, times have changed, which mm. is fantastic. Mm. Oh. And Faith, for you, part of your childhood was where I grew up as well. So. Mm -hmm. I, I know from the other side just how much... I, I grew up in Hamilton. There was no Aboriginal people in Hamilton when I grew up. You'll be pleased to know. <laughs> I look back now and go, oh, my God. But you grew up in a similar area. Yeah, where I grew up after I moved from living with my grandparents in, um, up in Swan Hill, we moved down to the Western District when, when I was five. So we were just assimilated into the white community where we lived and we were, you know, there was no racism or anything. We were just part of the community. Um, we talk, spoke about, we knew who we were. We had stories uh, that were given to, or especially to me when I was a child by my grandparents that I was um, living with, with my parents as well. But it was really um, important to be, to learn more because when I was at school it was just that bums and spears that was there uh, front and centre. And, you know, if I had said anything about um, no, that's not right, well, the, you know, the teacher knew, knew everything. They were right. And I had many times sitting outside the principal's office because I spoke up and said my piece. Does that surprise you too that only Faye spoke up? <laughs> <laughs> I was, you know, so... Um, angry about it. They just wouldn't listen to what I was saying. And um, it's, it's sort of, you know, some of our kids now, or most of our kids nowadays, are so proud of who they are. They've got their identity. They know who they are. They know uh, where they come from, uh, who, which mob they're connected to, and, you know, can go right back to their grandparents and great-great-grandparents uh, as well. But, you know, when I was a child, it was just, you know, that, that language barrier was there because I didn't hear language when I was a, a kid oh. when I was growing up. So mm. it was something that I wanted to do to learn my language but also to get out and teach kids um, about First Nations culture in this country and to be proud of it and to, you know, stand up and say, hey, I'm a First Nations person and I'm proud of who I am. So that's one of my um, big 
bugbears still is to um, educate not just the children but the teachers that teach those kids as well. How do you think we're going? Because I was at a school recently where a child um, described Charlie Perkins, you know, the amazing uh, man, as part Aboriginal. And I went, oh my God, what year are we in? Exactly. And being the gentle person I am, I went, oh yeah, his toe, his ear, what part of him was Aboriginal? Like, <laughs> are, we, are, we moving, <laughs> are we moving away from that? Because I know, Corinna, you mentioned that in the past it was, you know, full-blooded or you weren't. Are we finally getting past that? Um, yes, we are. Yeah, it has come a long way, but it still it depends what social event you're in, what environment you're in, mm. as to what what that may be. Um, definitely had some recent experiences that I won't share, <laughs> be here all day. Um, yes, um, we are, but th there's still ways to go. I think little, the more we can do at that early years, in the early years intervention, they're, mm. they're little sponges and they, they haven't got any learnt bias or anything. Um, that they're who they are. They are really their own little individual souls and that's where you're seeing change and, and they're going home and they're educating their parents and telling their parents about bundjul and, and talking about Wadarong people and land, country and water and acknowledgements and, and this was something that was never spoken about in the homes sure. or things that weren't in the education sector. I was fortunate enough that I worked under Auntie Faye 24 years ago um, as a Koori <laughs> preschool assistant and Auntie Faye was my boss at that time but my first mentor and um, I think of back then going into the schools and the educators would want us to know everything and do things with the children but there was it, it wasn't the right way of doing things. We weren't there to um, give a teacher a break so she could sit down on their mum as an extra help support or, or um, you know, mm. it, was, it was a really challenging space back then and I, I mm. definitely see now how much the early years sector has changed. And it does boil down to having allies. Like, I, you know, are you an ally? I, are you passionate about this? Because it makes a difference. If a teacher is like that, um, it makes a difference. So it is, it's not, you've got to personally understand to make a difference in your professional sector. Mm. And Fan, what makes a good ally? One that come, comes on the journey with you, learns with you, and um, is open to um, criticism, and also oh. to, you know, find out more for themselves, but to ask, ask the question that they have been hanging back from asking. And I think that's the biggest challenge for teachers. They are a little bit, oh, can I ask that? And I always say to teachers, no question's a silly question, so ask it. Oh. And remember that because we'll have questions later and you're allowed to ask anything you like. <laughs> um, what about for you, Edie? What do you think makes a good ally? Um, a, a, a good ally really understands and listens. Um, mm. They understand Aboriginal protocols. Um, they really listen to what Aboriginal people are saying because often in Aboriginal dialogue, the onus is on the listener to have that reciprocal understanding to really connect and mm. um, have really strong relationships. And it's about them challenging themselves and educating others at all opportunities, be it out at a barbecue, be it at a meeting, if something that is said well intended about First Nations people Pull it up. Don't let it go past. You know, really try to to educate the wider public because you don't know what you don't know. Mm. And it's about that seriousness of w walking together, mm. you know, with the end vision of having a brighter future for everyone. And the start of that journey... But Sue... <clears throat> Sorry, Edith. I wanted to pick up on the question you asked 
uh, you know, you asked earlier about mm. moving on from this concept of part Aboriginal. I, I think we're trying very hard, but I still notice, it was still noticeable when I left schools five years ago, and I still he, hear of this, is where teachers often say to Aboriginal kids, oh, but you don't look <laughs> Aboriginal. Yeah. And when you have a teacher saying that to you, two or three times a day, you can imagine what that does to a young kid in terms of how they are valued within an education setting. So that's kind of, if you said to me, what would you like to see change in? Mm. I'd love to see where uh, anyone says, oh, I'm Aboriginal, I'm da da da, I'm from Bardi, I'm from the Kimberley where we don't have to verify ourselves. Mm -hmm. when, when an Italian or French or anyone says, oh, I'm, I'm a French, um, oh, I'm Italian, we don't say, oh, but you don't look Italian. You know, we don't do that. We don't even do it when but you say, kind of, you know, when I say to you, I grew oh. up in Hamilton, you don't go, well, you don't look it. Like, <laughs> we don't yeah. even do it with that. Yet oh, we've got people that. that yeah, but it, it's, it's still happening. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about not just the bare bums and spears, but representation in books. Uh, there is this, I think, there's a strong tendency, and I think it's changing, but to represent, say, an Aboriginal boy as a larrikin or a good footballer, and that's mm -hmm. what they are, full stop. You know, there's nothing else to them. What would you like to see Aboriginal people, or how would you like to see Aboriginal people represented in books, Aunty Faye? Um, just to show that uh, we do other things than football and sport. I think it's really important to, uh, you know, in a story that uh, somebody's writing, to say, look, we do the same thing as what everybody else does within the community. So let's write a story about that. If this Aboriginal person is um, is a nurse, or uh, they go into um, into the the city as you know, might be a train driver or something like that, or even get on the air on the plane and they're a hostess. So you know, there's got to be um, that representation of what we do today, not what we did in the past. Mm. Karina? Yeah, something that comes straight to my mind was our, our young boys, our males. Um, it's really seen as a perspective that um, they have to put a lap lap on, dance, shake a leg and hold a spear and, you know, clap some boomerangs. And it's not our boys of today and mm. I feel it really impacts on our young boys of today mm. because not everyone wants to put on a lap lap and dance and, and be that warrior, but it, there's still that perception that boys will be warriors and our boys oh. of today, much has changed in the way children are raised and whatnot today and every boy has the ability to be who he wants, how he wants and how he wants to connect with the culture. It does not have to be you're accepted if you throw a lap lap on and shake a leg. Mm. So I, I'm, I'm finding that one, I want to see a lot change in that space. And like Annie Faye said, and it's the same for a boy, it's the football. You know, they mm. must, they, they're recognised if they're a good footballer and, and things like that. But we have beautiful people that sing music to, to beautiful males that are caring for their elderly people and, and, and doing, we've got some beautiful male health workers locally here in our community and male teachers as well that are doing great stuff here in our community. So it's that reflective of, of yeah, who we are. Yeah. What about for you, Edie? I, there's still a stereotype mm. out there on perceptions of um, First Nations people. And I remember reading a, um, a, a, a thesis written by Dr. Chris Sarr in education. We interviewed a whole range of people across Australia and a sizable amount in research. And he asks them, what's your perception of Aboriginal people? 
And it was gardeners, it was cleaners, it was um, sports, it was art, um, unemployment, and all of that. Not one was about a doctor or a nurse or an engineer or a surgeon or anything like that. And I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with, with um, the results of these surveys, but we are better than that. We are better than that. So mm. my point is I'd like to see that um, portrayed in, in our literature that we have out there and, and the media and all of that instead of the, um, <coughs> that, that stereotype still has to be broken, I believe. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And I think that leaning to, and um, you guys might like to comment on this, but my belief is that leaning on AFL footballers to share culture and to write books and to, there are so many incredible First Nations writers that are quite capable of telling those stories and in a much better way. Is that fair or am I being yeah. awful? No, that's fair. <laughs> I might be letting it, my biases show, but I figure I can say it and you can ignore it. <laughs> um, and the other thing too, in there's something like, I don't know the exact percentage, but most, I'll say most Aboriginal people live in urban areas now, don't they? Isn't that, do you know the yes, percentage? Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, yes. So, I don't know the percentage. You know, and we still tend to think, and some people have this mentality that the, um, the real, real Aboriginal people are at Uluru or at Kakadu or... Yes. It's just, you know, and we're 2022, it's nuts. That's right. Let's talk about truth-telling in stories particularly because all of what we've talked about with representation comes from that um, paternalistic, colonial, put-down stuff how important is the truth telling that we acknowledge that that we get that out Edie, do you want to start with truth telling look i think it's extremely important i you know it, for so long for so long we've we've had to we've had to listen to the stories of of the perceptions of how Australians see us and they haven't got it right. Um, I think the truth telling at all levels is so important and I would love to see our school libraries full of books that are written by First Nations people um, in collaboration with allies um, and they're telling the truth, they're illustrating the truth in our school libraries, because I say schools, because kids are curious and it's important that they are raised with that information there, that they take home to their families, they take the truth home to their families, it's discussed with their families, they grow up with the truth. Mm. So it's, it's incredibly important that it's, it's told um, by First Nations people. Mm. Karina? <coughs> Um, I wonder how many in this room have, have, are aware of the Geelong timeline, that the Geelong one fire and one of the members that is now passed spent a lot of time putting together a Geelong timeline. And that timeline is all about truth telling. And something like that for me, I'd love to see on the front of the Geelong advertiser. I'd love to see that every person that lives in Geelong is is aware of that timeline and know some of the, the significant stories and how many of you know that the first Aboriginal person that was killed by shotgun happened here on Wadawurrung country? How many know that Batman arrived here on Wadawurrung country? Oh, this is the truth telling that needs to be told. Um, also the Yurok Commission that's happening, so people are not unaware of the Yurok Commission, what it means. But all they've done is replace the word royal with Yurok. Are you familiar royal with the commission? Sorry, do you, are you familiar with Yurok? Would you like to just explain what the commission is? Yeah, so a, the Yurok commission is like 
how normally we have the Royal Commission into things. So it's about listening to those lived experience, the truth telling, and that's taking place at the moment through the Uruk Commission that's happening in Victoria alongside the treaty. So that is taking place at the moment. Um, many people have the opportunity to share their stories and their lived experiences and be heard and be part of that. But because we've removed one word which is inappropriate to us, a lot of people don't know what it is. And that's a prime example of Uruk Commission. Doesn't, we're not going to call it a Royal Commission. And it's uh, run by um, First Nations people, mm. speaking to First Nations people to get their stories told at long last. You know, mm. there's, a, there's a lot of hurt. But you're right, Karina, it's, it's, mm. Keep going. it's about capturing that lived experience, mm. you know, and, and that can only be captured by First Nations people themselves. Mm. That's yeah. right. And I think... We, First Nations writers, I, I believe that we, we have a responsibility to, to call it. If we see any literature written that we know isn't authentic, you know, isn't, isn't representative of the truth-telling, then I, I feel that we have a responsibility to call it mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, and to put it out there and say, no, this isn't quite correct what you've written about us. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Adifa, did you want to talk about truth telling? Do you want to add anything to that? No, I think it's um, one of the things with the Uruk is that it's done by our people for our people, which is really important. And there's going to be a lot um, that all come out in that. And it's, um, you know, some of these um, older... First Nations people have been mm. uh, bottling up mm. all this trauma from the past that they want to talk about. So at long last they've got somewhere where they can talk about it and not be uh, put down. Mm. I think we only have to look at um, recent... I'm using football because it you know, attracts attention. Recent events on football where people spoke up and said we were treated badly by these people and we most of people automatically went with Hawthorne, and, well, that's what I'm talking about, went with the club and went, oh, could that be true? You know, this is just a couple of people that may be missing. We never, as a society, go, that's really bad, and look at the institution. We go with the institution, oh, they wouldn't do that, would they? As mm -hmm. a society, and it's just, it's got to stop. It's it got to stop. It does. You know, it, I, think, I think it was only, it might have been Edie that said to me, you know, if these people are speaking up, it's taken a lot of courage, a lot of courage and a lot of yes. guts to actually go, that wasn't right. That's, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to comment more on that? Or? I think, you know, there's so many of our elders who have um, spoken already, but there's also some elders that they have spoken that they've passed after they've spoken, which is a really sad indictment that this has happened um, sort of closer to the end of their life, if it was um, brought on a lot, of er lot earlier, they would be still around and would be able to live right. a, um, their life so much better. At least they've got that off their chest. I think mm. uh, if that, you know, the Uruk was available a lot earlier, a lot of our um, elders that have passed would have um, felt more uh, more at ease in themselves. Let's, with all that knowledge in our head and a lot to think about, let's talk about writers, um, non-First Nation writers. We understand that we have to include and make sure our representation when we're writing is our whole community and that we're also truth-telling, we're not perpetuating lies and things of the past. Where it can be difficult for non-First Nation people is that part of the trade of writers is to inhabit another. Like, I quite often write from a boy's point of view. And so some First Nation, non-First Nations writer will say to you, but hold on, it's my job to imagine what that character would do. How do you respond to that? I um, respond to that by saying you haven't uh, lived that life, so how can you write about it? Yeah. 
Karina, what about for you? Yeah, very challenging in the space I'm at, working in Wadawurrung Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation. Um, many books, many, many things go out where they have not had a, consult, had a consultation and, and the content isn't right. Mm -hmm. And um, too many people do Google or read the really <laughs> old journals and things like that, which you're only hearing one side of the story. Um, an example is down here is William Buckley. I don't like to say that name, but everyone wants to write about William Buckley. William Buckley's views are William Buckley's views. And it's not, it oh. should be about Wadawurrung people mm. and not about William Buckley's story. Um, so yeah, it's um, a very, very challenging space and don't rely on Google. Mm. It is not <laughs> correct. Not. And particularly in Victoria, so much has evolved as um, myself and Ani Faye as traditional owners from Victorian areas and since um, the registered Aboriginal parties have come in, much has evolved and, and it's really important just to seek those approvals, collaborate or work with the, with the traditional owners, traditional custodians of that land and the, the appropriateness of what you, what you are saying and sharing. Mm. And don't go on one view mm. as well to when, so say you're just talking to one First Nations person you know, it's really important to understand that, yeah, it's, it's an inclusive voice and what one might say may not be the view of others as well too. Mm. And would it be correct to say, Corinna, if I'm, um, say, I go, okay, I'm living on Gadigal country, which is Sydney, and I'm going to write about a character from there and I know Corinna, so I go, oh, is this right? Can you, can you comment on another country like that if I'm going... No. Mm. Yeah. No. You've got to yeah. follow the protocols. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Cultural Edie, do you want to comment on that at all? Look, I, I think it's unethical, I think it's immoral, and I think it's un-Australian for non-First Nations writers to even believe and think they can write about us. Yeah. You, you, they simply do not have that lived extreme uh, um, history that has been handed down through generations. Yeah. They don't have that lived understanding of Aboriginal culture and Aboriginal protocols that are handed down through us, you know, from the moment we are born. It's kind of like my husband saying, who I've been married to for decades, oh, <laughs> I've lived with you for so many decades, you know, I know you, therefore I have a right to write about you or your family or your body culture. Well, hello, he does not have a right because he simply is not Aboriginal and he has not lived that experience, have that had that lived experience. You know, we have so many outstanding First Nations writers. I mean, look at the last four or five Miles Award, um, Miles Franklin have gone to, um, First Nations writers. It's not as if we don't have a lot of writers and illustrators and storytellers out there. We do. Mm. The time is right now for First Nation uh, writing to be done by First Nations for First Nations for the wider Australian audience. I feel mm. strongly about that. Mm. Yeah. And man, aren't there some great writers. Do you want to, um, I mean, I know who I love, but I'm non-First Nation. Do you guys want to share some writers that you've really loved? Apart from Annie Faye and Edie and Karina, obviously. Faye, do you want, have you got favourite um, writers at the minute? Young Curly Saunders is a young um, a writer. She's also a poet. And she's really connected to her culture and that flows through her writing and it's a really beautiful um, way that she describes her um, lived culture, how she was brought up and um, how she, you know, lives today and what she does as well. Mm. Yeah, she's a, she's a cracker and she's beautiful too so we don't like her at all. <laughs> she's got it all. <laughs> have you got a favourite, Karina? Um, I just... I really don't have time to read a great deal. I don't know so why. I'm going do to be honest time? on that, unless it's the books, the, the gorgeous um, books that Annie Faye's put together with the granddaughters. But I will say I love reading, you know, like 
Archie's story mm -hmm. and, and the stories of people's lived experiences and journeys. Um, I really enjoy reading those types of books because when we read them, we can relate to them. Mm. And, you know, we have so that, that, that lived experience we can relate to. And, and yes, bless you, you, you really feel what they're saying. But in some ways it also empowers you as well because you often feel, can feel so alone in so many spaces. Something else I just quickly want to touch base mm. on from the, um, yeah, please do. what we just spoke about um, was about also with books, about the illustrations of books. So I have a young son who's an artist and we sit here today with knowledge and I've still got many more years of knowledge to learn as well. Um, the ladies next to me have a wealth of knowledge but he had recently done artwork and he the artwork was submitted on something that wasn't appropriate, but he was too young to have the knowledge to, to ask about, well, what is the content? What is this going on? And um, their things, you know, at a young, we all learn as we go as well, but got to be mindful of how people are using art as inappro mm. cultural inappropriateness as well. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Who's your favourite writers, Eddie? <laughs> I had to laugh because I love uh, Melissa Lukashenko's Too Much Lip. Oh, I that just, is the I love that book. story. <laughs> I could really connect with it. And, and it's a great story about a young a, a woman and going on a journey. But I also, you know, equally we have, you know, I could rattle them off. Tara um, Winch, you know, The Yield. Um, Scott, um, oh, gee, Kim Scott from WA mm. who's won several miles. Alexis Wright, you know, I could rattle them off. Bruce Pascoe. Um, and, and the lovely one, Another Day in the Colony by Chelsea Watego. That's a great book. Yep. <laughs> well, I love that. And whenever I come across something that is really about assimilation, I say, oh, yeah, Another Day in the Colony. <laughs> but we have some fantastic writers out there. And we have, we have some great kids' books. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, you and Aunty Faye, those, you know, oh. respect, family, sharing... You know, that's the, that's the deepness of our culture, you know, that sort of stuff. But, Sue, what I've noticed is, um, and, and I guess it's because I'm on the board of Mugabala Books, is we have a lot of First Nations writers now that have been in another profession and they're moving into writing as a way of truth-telling. And I'm talking about uh, Helen Milroy, who's a psychiatrist. And um, she writes a lot of her stories have got um, themes around bullying and reconciliation and things like that. So well, I'm noticing there's a bit of a, you know, that's happening, which is fantastic because it gives that huge diversity to First Nations writing. Mm. But I could go on and on about First Nations literature. Yeah, I think basically look at Mugabala Books. I mean, we're biased, clearly, yes. but Mugabala Books <laughs> owned by... Um, Aboriginal people, um, the publishers, the publicity people, they're all First Nations people. So when you, and again, I'm going to say something, you might guys might want to say it, but I'll be brave and do it. You're probably too tactful. There are a lot of publishers that are going, oh, hell, that's old. Well, let's do a, let's do a First Nation book. Mm -hmm. And they haven't got the heart in it and they're just, they're missing the mark, aren't they? I think. Yeah. The, um, I know Faith because we've had quite a they're, few. <laughs> they're definitely missing the mark. Yeah, you know the, 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 they've capitalised it on as an industry, Definitely. you know, and they, they they see it as as an industry, and they don't have they don't have the deep understanding. They don't have the First Nations editors and consultants and mm -hmm. people on the board on their board to be guiding them with what is genuine truth telling. Yeah. So be discerning. Just, you can piece together different things we've said about that. There's another book I know Aunty Edie and um, Aunty Faye and I've talked about. It's a young adult book, Boy from the Mish, if you ever get to get hold of that by Gary oh. Landsberg, I think, um, about a young boy growing up and, you know, is he gay, isn't he gay, where do I fit? Oh, it's the most beautiful story, isn't it? Mm. It's just, it's just beautiful. So the writing that's coming out gives me goosebumps. It's, yeah, beautiful. Oh. So... Yeah. We might go to questions a little bit early, five minutes early. I'm, where are my beautiful microphone people? I'm sorry. We were supposed to go at quarter two, but I'm thinking we're covering so much and I've got plenty more I can ask. But 
I know with Auntie Faye and with Edie, and I'm sure with Karina, I haven't actually asked her this, Auntie Faye and Edie's whole thing is sharing culture. Well, I do know because I know what Karina does. Sharing cult culture, breaking down misconceptions, helping you with questions. So let's go to questions early. Are you three happy with that? If we do, sure. yep. Have yeah. you got any questions you'd like to ask um, about what we've talked about or maybe what we haven't covered that you want to know? And as Faye said, no th such thing as a stupid question. Please ask. Yep. Hi. Hi. Auntie Edie, I'd like to ask a question about, um, for basically some support on how to deal with um, the question that was raised earlier, so am I part Aboriginal and I don't look Aboriginal? Uh, and yet, like, I, I understand it's my responsibility to respond in an unemotional way because the person's not actually trying to have a go at me or anything. Um, but yeah, just I just wonder if there was some sort of practical you know, it's good to be prepared and just have some standard one-off comment, you know, responses to try and deal with that situation a bit more, ta you know, tactfully instead of making it an emotional sort of exchange or trying to, I don't feel like I want to try and educate someone who's spent their whole life forming their view based on what they've already learnt. But it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely a question that get, gets asked a lot and I could... I would like to ask if there was any uh, little practical tips of, of how to deal with that situation well. Yes. So you're, uh, um, let me just get this right, you're saying that people often say to you, oh, but you don't look Aboriginal. Yes. Yeah. Um, look, I'd say, look, thanks for, thanks for, um, in making the comment or thanks for that but can I talk to you by yourself for a minute please and I'd just go off quietly and I'd explain to them look um, in, in my culture we don't refer to being as part Aboriginal you don't look Aboriginal you know I, I, I am Aboriginal and you need to take that at face value and value that you know I, I think we've got to call it in a sensitive way but I'd take them off into the corner and say look um, yeah, I'd, I'd be, and I'd be explaining how you feel. Look, I've had this thrown at me all my life, and and I really don't feel uncomfortable about being being um, questioned on my um, indigeneity. But I, I'd do that in a um, in a sensitive way. But I wouldn't take it. Mm. Do you two want to add some advice there? Yep. That's, yeah, yeah, I think it's um, you need to put it back onto them. Mm. Ask them oh. where they come from. And then when they say who they are, where they come from, you say, well, you don't look at either. So, you know, put it straight... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> put it straight back onto them. Because it's, uh, you know, as Edie was saying, it's we've been... All our lives we've been asked, you don't look it, you're not dark enough, you don't have this, the squashed nose. It's almost like you're trying to, like you're not being true to them. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It comes from here. I'm oh. Aboriginal. It's, it comes from here. I know who I am. So, so don't start putting a label on me. And maybe connect. You know, these guys can help you connect with people. Oh, the more support, than happy. More than happy. Yeah, the yeah. support round, I, from the outside looking in and from what I know of Faye and Corinna and Edie, the support for people is unbelievable, I think. You know, from within the community with the Wadawurrung people. Um, it, yeah. There are places that we can connect you to to start that journey of trying to find out oh. your family yeah. connection. Yeah, 
It's okay. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. 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 So, you know, if your mum's Noongar, yeah. you are Aboriginal. Yeah. yeah. And Dad, yeah. you're still working on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wamba. Okay. Well, connect with me. I'm Wamba. Not Wamba, like I said earlier. No. Wamba. Th that's <laughs> that's the <a> language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's okay. But I think, from my point of view. But, and this is worth nothing, you're doing an incredible job. You, you know, I think you, it's, I can't imagine what it's like. And I think you're amazing, being. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so. Oh, no, hook it's up. Okay. I was going to say hook up, but that's a young person's name for other things. Don't hook up. Come up and <laughs> catch up with these two <laughs> afterwards. <coughs> My daughter spends a whole life rolling her eyes at me, going, You can't say that, Mum. I go, What? Another question. <laughs> Thank you. And thank you all for being here today. It's been very um, enlightening and uh, thought provoking. And I just a comment and a question. My comment was when you were talking about going to school in Hamilton, actually. And I have this really clear uh, recollection. I went to school at a Catholic primary school in the 60s. And I clearly remember leaving that school thinking there are no Aboriginal people left. Just the way that it was taught, um, you know, the way they basically thought that everybody died out. So it was quite a shock later on to <laughs> realise there were people there and so grateful that there is. But my question really goes back to the first question um, that you asked about when consultation doesn't happen, you know, what kind of goes wrong? But I'm interested to hear if you've got examples of when consultation has worked well and what have been the outcome, you know, for both sides involved, both parties involved, if you've got hopefully some good examples of when it does work well. I think it's the naming of different places here in, in Geelong with that. What a wrong language. It's that consultation being asking. They've been working together and that it shows by the naming of different buildings. So, you know, by that consultation and working together, you're going to have an outcome that you're both going to be proud of. Um, I'll, I can share what I've got on my lap, so great question. Uh, this I have song times on Wadawurrung Country. So this was a um, music teacher at Queenscliff Primary School and she was just seeing a lack of it. And a great, again, a great ally, wanted to see so much more I implemented in the curriculum. So she wrote some songs incorporating Wadawurrung language of our Wadawurrung language app, which everyone can access if they've got an iPhone for free. And um, she came to us said, I need to do this. I need to see this happening. How can we work together? Do you support me to do this? Am I OK to do this? And how can we collaborate together? So we went on a journey together. We helped her with the linguists. We helped her with the storytellings of the songs to make sure they were correct. And we have recently launched this book, which is Song Times on Wadawurrung Country. It is five songs that are based at um, early years, uh, early years right through to primary level. Um, we have Bundles Birds, Colours of Country, Cooling Water Now, Nara Mili, Our Backyard. Um, so in this, teachers can purchase this book for $30. It has a CD in the back of it as well. Um, and also how you can 
incorporate that. You know, you can be using clapsticks in that and whatnot. It's a language that we have approved. We've approved the, the whole process of this and been on the journey. So this has been a fantastic outcome of a great um, relationship. Also just recently worked with um, Ballerine Catchment as well. Uh, they're trying to do more awareness about putting rubbish in bins and the rubbish not going into our oceans. And, and they came and worked alongside us as well. And they had recently, they had done these posters, normal posters, and, and brought them to our attention. And we said, well, we can be incorporating Wadarong content into that. So we've had one of our Wadarong artists do the design of it. We put in what the traditional name is in Wadarong language, Shodurum, and we have a Wadarong perspective um, here as well about you know, Wadarong people would hear the sound of the growling grass frog. It would mean happy. This means that their water body was healthy and food sources were abundant. So it's quite easy of something so basic where you can be incorporating, we can be working together and you can be incorporating some Wadarong content. These are stickers that are on all the bins that so we hope people stop and read, um, but also just a way of educating people and adding some... It's a bit of a, a bit of giving to get back. So if we can give you a bit of storytelling um, that we hope, you know, that you'll put back that rubbish in the bin and it won't end up in, in the oceans as well. So, yeah, it just the outcomes are endless if you consult with us. We've recently worked oh. with the Wuriki Nyal City Greater Geelong Precinct and across the road of the Geelong Arts Centre Precinct. And um, you, every layer of the floor is going to be talking about Wadarong perspectives and First Nations perspectives and bringing story into, into the, the built form of four walls. So we're doing a lot of work with that as well at the moment. That's fantastic. Edie, have you got a favourite thing that works well? I'll look, um, I, I think the stuff that Karina just explained is, is, is starting to explode in schools. I think that's, I, I, I saw when I moved from the Kimberley to the Geelong region, um, a lot of goodwill and a lot of people trying really hard, particularly in schools, because that's where my um, expert, uh, expertise is. But I think at a larger scale too, I, I think back to the Kimberley, um, to the Yarra people in Broome who got native title, act, um, native title over their lands and seas, and they wouldn't lay down on that until they got um, their native title. Um, now they have um, all the broom schools teach Yaru um, through the, I think there's um, six schools in Broom. They all teach Yaru. Um, and they're trying to get that as a, a, um, a language that the kids can go through and um, speak right through to senior school and get qualified in. Um, they now have a housing policy for the young, for, for families to buy their own house rather than living in state housing. They have employment pathways, and that's a an example of where genuine collaboration has really benefited Aboriginal people. But I'm going to put in a plug here. I think there's even more scope for improvement, and we have. Mm -hmm to get the referendum going and get that voice to parliament happening. I think once that voice to parliament happens, then everything hangs off it and you will see closing the gap in health, education and social justice. Um, I'm a product of the education system from the 80s and 90s and I think a, probably the majority of what I was taught as being you know, true and accurate is very, very far from that. I was wondering what your recommendations would be about how to start re-educating ourselves. Um, uh, it was mentioned before that there is a lot of misinformation, particularly online. Um, are there any good sources or starting points that you would recommend um, for us to go and check out so we can get a much better idea of, of the truth? I think for in Victoria, um, it's Bunjalaka at the uh, museum. It would be a great place to start. Also the Koori Heritage Trust in Federation Square to start on a journey of 
relearning yourself would be a, a great start. Mm. And, mm. Oh, sorry. And then also um, through education with VAI, the Victorian Aboriginal Education oh. Consolidated Group, go through them as well to retrain and relearn as well. That's okay. Um, yes, so knowing what country you're on, the land you're on, and always recognising that in all you're doing. Um, if you're a teacher, looking at ways that you can incorporate and implement things, even if you're a, a maths teacher and a science teacher, there's ways you can be incorporating culture in, into those studies and that as well. Um, understanding country, being out on country, I think it's that personal learning that's really, really important. Mm. So if you're on Wadarong country, you know, you can jump on Wadarong Traditional Science Aboriginal Corporation, look at our Healthy Country Plan, look at our Healthy Country Plan video, download the app, look at the Wadarong Mother Tongue series, short, short little um, snippets we've got to tell you the stories of places, so the intangible stories of places. Um, looking at that Geelong website uh, that Geelong One Fire Group have put together. Um, just starting with those little things, but then pushing that through where you're working and that as well. But it is a personal learning and then you'll find you'll be able to push that more where you're working. So have you had the traditional owners come out and do cultural education there? What's the facility and that look like? Uh, are acknowledgements happening, even if it's a secondary space? Like, they shouldn't just be happening in the early years settings. They should be happening in the secondary space as well. Um, there's, there's many ways where you can be incorporating, even if you're in an event space. So are you um, per having First Nations businesses come to those events and, and what's the procurement happening for First Nations people? We have Nara Mili that's founded down here on Wadarong country that supports First Nations people in Victoria with small businesses and, and you've got Kinaway and there's things like that. There's so many, so many layers. And if you're working in a bigger sector, there is often a, someone in an identified position or a, a unit that, mm. you know, I encourage you to have a conversation with or go and access. And we have someone here that works at a unit at Deakin University. Um, yeah, so don't be afraid to reach out and, and, and look and, 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 yeah, rather than not doing, yeah, have a go. Be brave. Debbie, did you want to add, add anything to that? Yeah, um, also in, in most places that you'll have an Aboriginal education unit um, within um, the education system there, they'll have an, Ab uh, an Aboriginal education unit where you have got a wealth of information where you can go in and you can s talk to them about it. And I'm sure they'll, they'll guide you on, on where to... Um, get resources to um, in, be culturally responsive in your school and in your class. But there's also, as, as the ladies have said, um, there'll be an Aboriginal organisation or an Aboriginal co-op where you can go to, and I'm sure they'll, they'll provide some direction and leadership and support. And there are a lot of resources now that have teaching notes. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of uh, the Mugabala books have teaching notes and there are a lot of other books there now that have teaching notes to, to support you. And, um, and in essence, those teaching notes are saying we are now giving you permission to start teaching, to be culturally responsive in your school. So there's a, a, a lot of resources and avenues available for you to become a culturally responsive teacher or educator. Yeah, keep, as a person who's been and continues on the journey, you'll love it. It's the most amazing journey. You will get really mad and go, what the hell? You know, why has it been not taught to us? Why have we not? And then when you go on that journey to learn, it's a really, it's exciting. It's, there are moments of extreme frustration though. Um, and books. That's Auntie Edie's book. I thought it'd be, see, Edie, I've, um, Charlie Swin is beautiful, <laughs> and of course, you know, our books as well. So books too are a great starting point, and have a look at the Mugabala website. There are some incredible non-fiction and fiction, there's poetry, there's, and just, yeah, just soak it up and enjoy. I think for those of you going on the journey, when I first started working with Faye, I was 
horrified by what I didn't know. And I went to a talk, um, Deborah Cheatenham came, you know, the opera singer, she's a Yorta Yorta woman. And years ago, she did a talk for Women's Day, and she's a remarkable woman. And she said, don't be um, embarrassed by what you don't know. It's your job now to go find out. You know, once you know you don't know it, go find out the answers. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. And so, as about. I've always said to teachers and schools, you know, you, you, you've got to make a choice here now. You, you can't sit on the fence. You're either part of the solution or you, if you're not part of the solution, well, you're actually part of the problem. So, mm. please, I would encourage you to have a go. Have a go. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's okay. Now, I think we've got time for one last question up the front here. <clears throat> Hello, my name's Alison Wong. I live uh, at Mount Dunedin and I'm a writer. I'm working on a memoir, but that is quite a broad um, thing because I'm really wanting to understand more about where I live and the history and culture and stories and to engage and to learn from Wadalong people and be respectful of that. And also this year I had a uh, fellowship, a creative fellowship at the State Library of Victoria where I took the journey from Robe, South Australia and through the Western District to uh, the Vic Goldfields following the Chinese gold seekers who walked in the 1850s and 60s. And as I went through country, I was reflecting on the landscape and the stories, and I was so shocked that there was so little there of First Nations stories, and, you know, that everywhere I went, I saw the names of colonists who massacred First Nations people, and, you know, the tourist brochures and everything, never said anything about First Nations stories. Um, and it was all just touristy stuff. So as I write about my journey through all this and reflect on the Chinese who walked through country, I also want to reflect on the true uh, First Nations stories and what's happened and what needs to be done. So I would really like to learn and to listen to what you can tell all of us and how we can um, go forward, going back and forward um, to create a much better place for everyone and especially for you. Would you guys want to comment at all on that? Sure. Anyone want to? Yeah, Yatni, thank you for sharing. Um, yes, it is quite heartbreaking, um, particularly, you know, the loss of language. And the language names tell you more. It's not just a name. It belongs to either, you know, something that was known to that area or it may be the shape of our body that it represents or something like that. So it's so there's so much more with the traditional names that belong to areas that were rightfully um, taken and replaced with other names of people that have done wrong. And um, just on that note, with truth-telling, Alfred Deacon is one of those people as well and we're surrounded by the name Deacon. So this is all the stuff too that will come out through the Yurok Commission. But mm. to know more is to utilise somewhere like this, the Heritage Centre here at the library, mm. and go through some, some of the stuff they have here. But never then when you've collaborated what you want, then book a consultation to have it read over by traditional owners and see if it's what's appropriate and what's not appropriate to, to share. There's a lot of stories that aren't shared. We don't want out there in the public realm. And for us, our elders want to continue the oral storytelling. So it's not about us writing a book of all Wadarong stories and putting it out there. They want people to still be out on country with us and orally hear those stories out on country. So there's also that cultural respect that lays as well. But never put anything out there until it has been read over and, you know, the Wadarong people, because it's on Wadarong country, if it's about Wadarong, I know you're doing it about across 
many different lands, but yeah, be mindful of getting that um, yeah. approval or permission or consult. On that note, unless you guys want to comment, we're getting out of time. But um, the other thing with that too, and it's a whole other session, um, is shame of for now of being ashamed of how Aboriginal people are treated so people don't want to talk about it because it actually, you know, brings up some terrible things that were done. Some of it too is she agreed because they didn't talk about what was done because if they acknowledged Aboriginal people were there, then Aboriginal people owned the land and then we couldn't take it over and say this is our, you know, we're the squatter that's taken over. It's so complex as to why we haven't been taught and why... It's still being kept quiet, but I think shame, greed, I'd like to think it's more shame than greed, but there's an awful lot of greed, I think. Um, on that cheery note, <laughs> I'd like to thank our panellists, particularly as First Nations people are constantly, I know we, when I work with Aunty Faye and when I've been with Aunty Edie and Karina, constantly being asked questions like this, and it takes a lot from them and asks a lot from them to be as generous and open as they are. I think the word that strikes me with First Nations people is grace and respect and just incredible dignity in the way that they accept our questions and welcome our questions and deal with our questions. So thank you, Aunty Faye. Thank you, Corinna. Thank you, so thank you Aunty Edie, very much for your generosity and for <laughs> bearing your souls to us today. It's pleasure. It's a pleasure. Yeah. And thank you for your attention and for your questions. Now, uh, our showcase bookseller, Torquay Books, are downstairs in, watch the eyes over here, in Key Kirinik. Did I do it? <laughs> Not well. See, see Corinna's <laughs> polite. Did I do it, Faye? I'm going to be right. <laughs> See, we'll that's go, what I'm go with the flow today, so. <laughs> so downstairs, um, and we'll be down there to sign books and to chat to you, so please come down and say hello. And thank you so much for coming today. You can also, of course, borrow our books from the library and borrow a lot of the books that we talked from. In fact, I think um, Melissa Melshanko's book, um, Too Much Lip I Borrowed from the Library, it's hilarious. It is just... <laughs> And, but thought-provoking, thought like it stays with you long after you've read it. And thank you very much to the library for hosting us today. So thank you very much, everyone. Pleasure. Thank you.